Hey guys, going to get straight into this one because there's an awful lot to get through. If you saw my live stream yesterday and you stayed all the way to the end, you'll know that someone directed me to this website. This is the Ohio Attorney General's website. Harley Dilly has been brought up before in live streams that I've done related to Sebastian Rogers. So I think this report here has implications for the search for Sebastian Rogers, but also the search for many other missing people. I think we can learn a lot from the Harley Dilly case. So I'm going to read this in its entirety. It's quite a lot of reading, but let's go. So this is the Harley Dilly search, the good, the bad and the ugly that was published on 9-11-2020. So Harley went missing in December of 2019 and he was found three weeks later. So that's where we're going to start. So Port Clinton Police Chief Robert Hickman grew up two blocks from the home of Harley Dilly, the 14-year-old who went missing just before Christmas of 2019. Young Robert attended the church next door to where Harley would live with his family across the street from the empty summer residence where the teenager would be found dead on January 13th of 2020. The result of trying to slide down a chimney to get inside. The house was locked from the outside. For whatever reason, Harley wanted to get inside. Maybe he wanted to bunk off school because he was last seen on his way to school. And maybe he thought that would be a great place to hide out. Got down the chimney, but it was too tight for him. And he died of compression asphyxia. In the 23 days preceding that grim discovery, Chief Hickman and his department faced social media fueled protests and baseless accusations of ineptness, corruption and even complicity in Harley's supposed murder. The angry speculation came as the officers worked night and day, Christmas included, cancelled holiday vacations and along with the Attorney General's Bureau of Criminal Investigation and partners from a dozen agencies. They searched more than 150 acres of land and water, both on foot and with the aid of drones helicopters, dive teams and specially trained canines poured over weeks worth of surveillance video with absolutely no hint of uh, what happened to Harley. Interviewed classmates and family members of Harley's in Port Clinton as well as people from Washington State to Florida, a product of the team's active social media presence. None of these efforts turned up leads pointing to where Harley was, only where he was not, which is good enough. It's good enough for the beginning of a search, like rule out some places that they definitely are not. Worst, all the law enforcement expertise Chief Hickman could muster wouldn't be enough to save the boy's life. That's where I'm beating myself up because we brought in other agencies that deal with this on a daily basis and they were just stumped, the chief said. We have over 500 years of experience here every day and we were all looking at each other saying, what did we miss? Seven months after the Harley Dilly case was closed, the chief still struggles with the outcomes. Did we mess up or did we not? I don't know. I can't give you that answer. But my biggest recommendation for any department that experiences a case like this, don't be afraid to ask for help. And certainly in Sebastian's case, they've got a whole load of help from the FBI to the Secret Service, of all chipped in with their expertise. So I don't think Sumner County Sheriff's Office and the TBI can actually be faulted in Sebastian's case for the amount of expertise that they've brought in. The truth, according to the autopsy, is that Harley suffocated inside that narrow chimney, a space just 9 inches by 13 inches. He'd wriggled his way in, thinking he could get down, and um, sadly, he uh, suffocated before his parents even realised he was missing. There's nothing that the Port Clinton Police Department or any other law enforcement agencies could have done to save him. Yet the fact doesn't bring peace to Chief Hickman, for whom the case was personal from the start. Hickman's wife, Roseanne, lost a child in a fire in 1988, and a decade later the chief lost his only biological child in a stillbirth. That's tragic. I'd like to say it gets easier. It doesn't. But at least the family has closure. And that means more to me than anything. We don't have the unanswered questions, where's my child, that many, many people do months, even years later. But there were complications. By the time Marcus Dilly reported his son missing at 11.50pm on December 21st, the teen hadn't been heard from in 40 hours. 
That's a problem. We were working at a disadvantage in case of missing children, said a BCI agent who requested anonymity because she works undercover. The clock starts ticking before a missing child alert or Amber Alert even goes out, even when it's immediate. Given Harley's history of anger issues and problems at home, officers suspected he had run away. Harley had stayed away before, spending the night with friends when he got upset. He'd come home when he calmed down. So maybe that's why his parents didn't report him missing immediately. Thought he'd just gone off somewhere to calm down. Chief Hickman said about the teen who has Asperger's, which is a form of autism. It's on the autism spectrum. Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, so ADHD, and Oppositional Defiant Disorder. Most of our missing cases in Port Clinton, usually the kid's gone for a night or a weekend because he's mad at mum and dad. That's more true than not statewide. In 2019 in Ohio, there was 24,292 people reported to the Missing Children's Clearing House, less than a third of 1% of being abducted or kidnapped. So Chief Hickman and Port Clinton officers began their investigation by interviewing Harley's parents as well as friends he had stayed with previously. They gathered surveillance tape from a recovery home next to Harley's house, the former church that the chief attended, and nearby Wagaruda Hospital. We had to watch almost a week's worth of video in real time, the chief said. I spent Christmas Eve and Christmas Day at Lighthouse Sober Living right next to the Dilly's house watching video. So did some of our officers, some of the drug task force, everybody jumped in. But with the video providing no answers and Harley still missing on the holiday, Chief Hickman and his department turned to organising a massive search, seeking community help, drones with infrared capabilities and specially trained dogs. The chief called in, amongst other agencies, BCI and the US Marshal Service, State Highway Patrol, FBI, Ohio Department of Natural Resources and US Customs and Border Protection. Could Port Clinton have sought help sooner? Yes, it's impossible to ask for help too soon in such cases. But BCI Special Agent in Charge, Jimmy Chiotti, who helped work on Harley's case, doesn't fault the chief for making time for those initial steps. Chiotti cited parsimony, the practice of starting an investigation by focusing on the most obvious angles. Absolutely. Occam's razor usually applies the simplest explanation in the absence of anything else to lead you to a more complicated explanation is usually the right one. But not so in this case. Hickman did a remarkable job from the start, said Chiotti who worked in law enforcement for more than 30 years. It's just an unfortunate thing that surveillance video didn't reveal anything. Same with Sebastian. Harley's case was the aberration of my career. That's, that's strong words. And the case was greatly complicated by Harley's ever use of Instagram, Facebook, YouTube and Reddit. Like many other kids, Harley wanted to be famous. His online posting, including videos in which he complained about his parents and others recorded while he was in the bathtub. See, we don't know anything like that in Sebastian's case. We don't know what he was doing online. Katie and Chris have said that he doesn't have access to the online world at their house. They're aware of his poor social skills. But at Seth's, his dad's, he's got free reign. He can game, he can talk to people online. His dad leaves him overnight while he's at work. So there is potential for Sebastian to have an online presence that we don't know about. He's sitting there with no shirt on, just talking away in the bathtub. He gave out his phone number and his address, and basically he did everything safety experts tell kids not to do. Many of the people Harley interacted with online or who followed him or liked his posts live far away from Port Clinton. And some uh, who had problematic histories were people the teen would have refused to talk to in person. The social media platforms were slow to respond to subpoenas, they always are, in part because of the holidays which hindered the investigation. In fact, because of vacations, some of the law enforcement agencies that partnered with Port Clinton initially sent teams with qualified investigators, but not necessarily in the roles that they were used to play in. Chief Hickman, whose department had 17 sworn officers, called those who hadn't left the state back from holiday vacation. Port Clinton's senior detective was in Florida with the city's Boy Scout troop. So Detective Ron Timmons, a Marine veteran who had been in the department since 2012, was assigned the case. Ron did phenomenal. He's a young detective and I hope I'm alive to see him in my position today. 
The wild world of social media. We know all about it, don't we? A YouTube search for Harley Dilly turns up dozens of videos in which people accuse his parents, Heather and Marcus, of killing their son. BCI's entire interview with Heather Dilly, obtained by Toledo TV station via a public records request, was posted to YouTube, where dozens of people ripped into her in the comments section, accusing her of lying because she doesn't say what they think she should say. Sounding familiar, anybody? Similarly vicious were the responses to one interview she gave to a TV reporter. Never mind that the investigation had included a thorough look at Heather and Marcus, their actions before and after Harley went missing, their home, the garbage truck that the father had driven on December 20th. Oh, see, garbage truck involved, Sebastian. They searched the landfill. Garbage truck was in the area that day. One of the search dogs alerted on a dumpster at the construction site. So we do have that uh, angle in Sebastian's case as well. The facts of the case eliminated both parents as suspects. That won't stop social media. I'm not going to judge the parents because I didn't raise Harley, Chief Hickman said. They cooperated from day one. Once we started talking to them, I was at their home every day. And if I'd asked, could I remove Harley's bedroom wall? They would have said yes, by all means. But there's an ardent segment of social media users who follow missing child cases as if they were a soap opera or a choose-your-own-adventure story. The wannabe sleuths set up private groups in which they can and do run wild with speculation, built from bits of evidence. Sometimes true, sometimes untrue, and sometimes wildly misinterpreted. They post theories and congratulate one another on connecting dots that police failed to. It's unbelievable, Chief Hickman said. I've never looked at it that way until I started following other cases of people who went missing. Some of the same people commenting on Harley's were on those pages. So I don't know if they just sit at home and think up conspiracies. I don't understand it. On YouTube, some theories centred on the fact that Harley's coat was hanging in the house where investigators found his body. Evidence, the theory suggests that the teen had been kept there by... An abductor. Harley's coat hangs on the door in the home where he was found. They knew about the coat because a crowd of media and onlookers had gathered the night that BCI processed the scene and some took photos through the lit up windows. The mistake that's going to haunt me for the rest of my days is we hung the coat on the door. We should have blocked the windows during the search, but that's hindsight. The chief had been among the first officers to enter the home and he picked up the coat from the floor, turned it right side out and photographed it. He took the photo across the street to Harley's parents to confirm that the coat belonged to the teen, an affirmation that supported the search warrant that allowed BCI investigators to comb through the house that night. When the chief finished photographing the coat, he hung it on the door, in part because he hadn't brought along an evidence collection kit. He hadn't entered the house expecting to find signs of Harley. The conspiracy theorists didn't care to learn the true context. They took the coat as proof that police were hiding something. People took to wishing me dead and people were giving me death threats. I would tell my wife to stay off the rabbit hole of the Facebook groups. I'd say, sweetheart, I'm used to it, but you're not. Welcome to the world of being a police officer. At times, the online speculation and vermins jumped from the virtual world to the real world, resulting in protesters demonstrating in Port Clinton before and after Harley's body was found. Is this sounding familiar to anybody? First, the protesters criticised the job Port Clinton police were doing, demanding, for example, that they bring in the National Centre for Missing and Exploited Children, or the FBI. Is this sounding familiar? Both of which had already been on the case for weeks. The protesters also demanded that the police charge the parents. Again, sounding familiar, who at this point have been cleared. Later, protesters accused police of a cover-up. After word got out that the protesters planned to picket Harley's funeral, oh, dear God, the chief had to issue a strong warning that those without appropriate permits would be cited. Also, Hickman's department arrested protesters for trespassing on the property where Harley's body was found and reported a Sandusky resident who had used Facebook to arrange a protest, even though she was a Tier 3 S. Oh, barred from the social media platform. 
be ready for protest, especially if a case like this is prolonged, Chief Hickman advises colleagues. Start thinking outside the box to deal with protesters because your community is always on your side except for a handful of them. My neighbour still thinks I had something to do with it, which is crazy. Second to last puzzle piece. On January 13th, having exhausted leads in what increasingly looked like an unsolved case, investigators decided to start back at the beginning. That's what we should all do. That's what all investigation should do. Laurie Braunschweger from the BCI had recently gotten back from the holidays and became our new analyst. We were driving from the landfill where we were coordinating the search that would happen the next day back to the PD. And I said, do you want to see where Harley lived? She did. And when she was there on Harley Street, she posed a fateful question. Has anybody checked out that summer house across from the Dillies' home? More than once, authorities had combed the double lot on which the house sits, sometimes using cadaver dogs and live find dogs. They had found no signs of forced entry and even a bloodhound so good that it had tracked Harley's route to school six days after he'd last walked it didn't hit on anything around the house. Man, you see, don't take anything for granted. Given the ground they needed to cover, officers moved on. The house sits amongst 180 plus buildings on the Dillies block and those immediate adjacent and there's far more buildings between the high school and an expanse of empty land east of Harley's neighbourhood. Port Clinton, which is about 6,000 year long residents, sees many homes occupied only during the summer when the city's population quadruples. What some civilians, including the backseat Sherlock's on social media, <laughs> backseat Sherlock's, I love that. I'm going <laughs> to... <laughs> I'm stealing that one. Misunderstood is that entering an empty property requires proof that there's a reason to. Probable cause, usually via a search warrant or permission from the owner. But since we're starting back at square one, Chief Hickman told Braunschweiger, I don't know how to say that, let's check it again. When the two got out of the cruiser to walk through the yard, Hickman discovered an empty lockbox on the back door that had previously gone unnoticed. Over the next several hours, the chief's wife, a real estate agent, would help identify the elderly owners as residents of Avon. A Port Clinton officer would make the hour-long drive to pick up a key and the chief police officers would enter the home for the first time. That's how they came to find Harley's coat and sweatshirt on the second floor. Beyond the clothing, specialised BCI crime scene investigators who searched the house that night found no other obvious evidence of Harley. No footprints in the construction dust, no food wrappers, no scent decomposition. The water in the home had been shut off. Only the first floor was heated, a bare minimum at that, and the second floor staircase had been blocked with a large piece of panelling. The chimney flue often described as blocked between the first and second floors, actually didn't extend to the first floor. You see, Harley wouldn't have known that, would he? The home had no fireplaces. The plaster walls on the second floor encased the chimney. The only suggestion that the chimney was there was a pair of six-inch diameter holes, one each in the rooms flanking the chimney, flue vents whose covers were found on the floor. Those elements were like puzzle pieces that refused to come together to form a single picture. BCI Special Agent Dave Hammond and Megan Roberts had seemingly hit a dead end, but they refused to leave until they solved the mystery of how Harley's claws had come to be in the house. If it hadn't been for their outstanding work, I don't think Harley's body would have ever been found, said the BCI agent who requested anonymity. Those agents racked their brains over the evidence presented before them, which was sincerely odd. The flu vents turned out to be the key. After a camera sent into the chimney recorded nothing useful, the agents reached into the holes. Hammond called me over and said, I think I felt a boy's head or a large animal that's dead, Chief Hickman said. So he goes, I don't want anyone in here because we're going to surgically remove the chimney. That's how they found Harley and a mini flashlight at his feet. Harley's outcome, it's tragic and almost unbelievable, the anonymous BCI agent said. I know when I first heard, I had more questions just based on its absurdness. 
The strangeness fed the online speculation, but people have died in chimneys. 1977, 14-year-old Robert Thompson went missing in Los Angeles. 28 years later, his body was found in a chimney at a house just blocks from where he had lived. 2001, 27-year-old Calvin Wilson was found in a chimney in Natchez, Mississippi. The man had gone missing 15 years earlier. 2008, 18-year-old Josh Maddox was found in Colorado Springs inside a chimney in a cabin a mile from his parents' home. He'd gone missing seven years earlier. To be honest with you, had Harley not kicked his jacket out of the chimney flue, we would never have known he was there. Years might have passed before his body was discovered, as happened in the three earlier cases. Because those crime scene agents are smart individuals who care about people and who don't give up, they found him, the anonymous BCI agent said. I was never prouder of BCI than when I heard. Harley had apparently climbed a rigid metal TV antenna tower outside the home and clambered into the chimneys only opening on the roof. He likely intended to explore the home or find a hiding place while he skipped school. The autopsy determined that Harley died within a few hours of going down the chimney, the result of compression asphyxia inside the 9 by 13 inch flue. The teen had no other injuries and had apparently shimmied out of his claws while inside as an effort to get more room to breathe. That's horrendous. Horrendous. My heart still mourns for Marcus and Heather. No child should have to die like that so close to your house. The discovery of Harley's body finally brought clarity to the case. Harley had such a large social media presence and he just went radio silent that Friday. This made perfect sense when nothing else up to that point had. Having an answer, however, didn't ease the disappointment for the officers and agents who had been searching for the teen or for the community who cared about him, all of whom had endured 23 days of hell. BCI investigators and the Port Clinton Police held a debriefing so that agents and officers could share their interpretations of the case, learn from the experience and hopefully move on. In today's day and age, you need closure. You need to get everything out. We needed that, whether everyone believed it or not. Actually, I had a couple of officers come up and thank me for doing that because we did everything we could and it just stinks that Harley was 100 feet from his house. But there was no signs. Five weeks after Harley's body was found, Chief Hickman wrote a letter to the residents of Port Clinton. Words cannot express the gratitude we have for the care and concern that was received from this wonderful community, he wrote. But even as the online trolls howled, members of the community cooked meals for the officers, sent them cards expressing their appreciation and put up pink lights and ribbons to support the search for Harley. That is the Port Clinton that Chief Hickman knows as home and the reason he sticks with a job that can seem crazy and undervalued day after day. Amid the turmoil and protests that have rolled the community this summer, too many have overlooked law enforcement's good intentions. Cases like Harley Dilly's are solved because of the passion and determination of the officers and agents who work them. Attorney General Dave Yoss said, make no mistake, they are solved because law enforcement cares. This is some advice for tough cases. So Sebastian's and any other case that seemingly is observed that, that doesn't make sense. Let's um, take some of these points on board. For departments facing a complicated case, not unlike the one involving Harley Dilly, Port Clinton Chief Robert Hickman said BCI agents offer this advice. Get all the resources you can as soon as you can. Other agencies want to help. All the agencies that were here were phenomenal. There are no egos, and that was really pleasant to see. The extra manpower also helped the Port Clinton officers cover both the usual daily business and the special investigation, and built connections among officers and agents who work throughout the state. Record and preserve everything. Take extensive notes about what has been checked, including buildings and people, to help coordinate with other agencies that join the investigation. Immediately get all the camera and surveillance footage possible. You only have a 24-hour window to secure video footage that records over itself once a day. You don't have to review everything right away, but it might help later. 
Take care of your people as they are your best assets. For example, when Chief Hickman's wife, Roseanne, noticed that officers weren't getting any sleep, she reached out to the family members to ask what they needed. It was a true family effort, the chief said. Be aware that the public is watching everything you do, but also remember, your community has your back, even if they're not as loud as your critics. And remember that hindsight is always better than what you know at any time. Wise words, the number of agencies that have been involved in Sebastian's case. The FBI, the Secret Service, with the technical capabilities to analyse digital information and video, have been utilised from the beginning. From the beginning. We know this. Check out the TBI's newsroom for the latest in the search for Sebastian Rogers and take that as your basis for any theory that you want to develop. Go and check out the live stream that I did yesterday. We talked about theories in relation to Sebastian's case. If you've got anything to add, you want me to add to the PowerPoint, then uh, put it in the comments to that live stream if you watched it on the replay. So, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of parallels between Harley's case and that of Sebastian Rogers. Let me know what you think in the comments and I'll see you in the next video. Bye, guys.